And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. Coming to us straight from Bog Folk, in the red corner we have Striga Wolf Vandenberg, or Van Denberg, Hi, sorry. I don't know why. <laughs> Too much Formula One. That's, I think that's why I keep I keep going with Dura, Dura and those kind of things. <laughs> and in the blue corner we have what we have, Walton Wood. How you doing today? How you doing today, gentlemen? I'm doing fine. Mm -hmm. Doing well, thank you. Yep. They are the they are part of the part of the um, six man te six <laughs> six person team develop developing as you can see on the screen, um, like Coma, a card a card based meat punk RPG. So let me get an obvious thing out out of my way. How many times have people accidentally called Lich Lichoma since you started? Oh, plenty of times. That's <laughs> been very common. The Lycoma balls joke is also very common. Yeah, I, that's the reason I didn't do it, is because I felt it would be a little too obvious. <laughs> a little too lo a little too um, low-hanging fruit. But with, but with that said, I usually start off with the origin story of people's tabletop experience. So, Strega, I'd like to start with you. What was what was your introduction to role-playing games? And uh, what my, made it stick? My biggest introduction, I started off with 5e, uh, just most people, I'm guessing. Uh, what really made it stick for me, though, was Mark Park. Uh, I mostly just got the book because it looked cool, and then I found out that there's an actually really fun system behind it, and that kind of made stuck me into making stuff for it and just keep on doing this hobby. Mm -hmm. And um, Walton, what what about you? How did you get how did you get started? Uh, I started out playing uh, second edition D and D uh, back. Uh, I want to say twenty three years ago when I was a freshman in high school, and. Uh, primarily played D and D um throughout high school, uh early in college and kind of dropped off uh later on when I went to grad school. And a few years back, uh, a bunch of friends and I started playing three five and Pathfinder again. And um like Strega, then I discovered Mercboard and um that was just like, you know, a revelation of rules light OSR style role playing which I'd never encountered before and just kind of opened the door to uh, exploring this, you know, vast treasure trove of uh, indie RPGs that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it definitely, it definitely sound, it definitely sounds like you get, like you guys. The, f the next question I was gonna, I was gonna ask is if you were largely system, um, single system lifers, but obviously that isn't the case. So. And I can see I can see where the influence of of Morkborg and the like would would come in, especially with the minimalist, not just the minimalist, um, almost punk like style, which I ended up I ended up saying to more to more when I had him when I had him on. But the but also the the fact that you guys set up a Spotify playlist for the for. The music of Morkborg, as you not not of Morkborg of Lycoma, as you guys see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lycoma is very inspired by music as well. Mm -hmm. The personal hobby of mine, and it really helps me with writing and with making art. Just mm -hmm. really setting the tone for something. Yeah. Uh, of course, also the uh, meat meat spec spawning didn't didn't exactly hurt. <laughs> it didn't. Uh, but. There's no, there's no shortage of suffix punk fiction, all fiction all over the place. I've, I've talked, I've talked quite a bit about about cyberpunk. I've gotten in trouble for breaking cyberpunk taboos with one of my podcasts. 
Um, <laughs> I've ta- I've talked about I've talked about Steam and Ma- and Magipunk and all that. Um, what is the way you would describe meat punk to people? I think the biggest way, or at least the biggest special part of meat punk, is that it's very much about the relationship you have with your body. Um, like other types of punk are usually about innovation and stuff like technology and for cyberpunk it's explicitly like future tech um but with meat punk it's a lot more focused on how corporations and fascists bigger entities would like take control of your body in a sense mm-hmm. like um in the setting it's very exaggerated to a sense of literally selling out your body and it being modified to do your job better uh but that's kind of something that's already kind of happening like most jobs require you to basically sell out your body in some sense or another and this setting is more about like really exploring that side of um life nowadays and just really focusing in on how horrible it is to basically not have control over your own body Mm -hmm. and i i know that in the kickstarter text you would refer to it as as um art punk i i chose to skip past that part because what it because art punk in my opinion is a very a very a very wide um net to cast mm-hmm. not to say it doesn't not to say it doesn't apply here but it's not as descriptive as meat punk to put to put it in that way yeah meat punk is our main focus yeah and, and it also tends to attract attention, like just people asking, "What the hell is meat punk?" And that's a pretty good <laughs> opening to pitch the game to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will. Ad- I will admit that's that. Um, something something that did something that did come to to mind to mind when I came when I was trying to visualize um, the setting that this that this takes place. The when is is some of is some of the far more biological um, work that uh, that obviously Giger has done, but also some some of the biological art that's been se- that's been seen and e- that's been seen throughout Eastern Europe for the last thirty years. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yes, yeah, like Beksinski, H.R. Giger, mm-hmm. uh, Francis Bacon, a whole yeah. bunch of different artists. They're all very big inspirations for me. And yeah. Yeah. Now, and if, uh, oh, sorry. One thing that I one thing that I will admit was part of the reason I I decided to I decided to reach out for, for my own interests is this is is it being described as card based because I have I've gone on record multiple times as saying that card based mechanics are severely untapped in the TTRPG space. Even na- even nowadays, there's still only a scant handful like that of games that are in my that are in my giant library that utilize cards. So I'm... yeah, we're mostly focusing the cards the card system on interpreting them. So mm-hmm. basically, going more for a tarot kind of style. So not not far removed from say Everway. Uh, I'm not too familiar with Everway personally. Do you know it, Walt? Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> this is this is the unfortunate part with spending with spending <laughs> way too much time. <laughs> Look, I I used to spend all all day and sometimes all night in libraries. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I ha- I was able to spend all nights in libraries is because I was there so much. The guy who ran the place just gave me a spare set of keys because <laughs> I was at. I would go in at ten o'clock and I wouldn't leave until ten. So, twelve hours a day for for sev- for several days, but <laughs> um, <clears throat> Everway, I, which um, re- which recently came back during its silver anniversary, is is de- definitely leans into a na- into a narrativist game, but isn't isn't necessarily doing pass fail it utilizes a tarot inspired fortune deck to in term for that is interpreted to see where the story would go would go next that does sound pretty similar the big part of this would be your cards would be 
basically your stats. Um, so through interpreting the cards and with having a conversation with the GM, uh, you would like figure out which move would fit best in this situation. So like, for example, if you have a marionette card, you could, for example, use your hooks in your back. You can use the strings, um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then through that, you can use it either through literally reading the card or through visually reading it, through interpreting it, or it's basically anything you, you think applies can apply. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it, is kind of, it is kind of interesting that um, part of the package is having character sheets that are the size of business cards. Yeah, we don't have that much like stuff to write down. The biggest mm -hmm. part comes from having these cards in your deck, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so the character sheets would mostly be for actually just keeping track of which cards you have and then storing that for a future session. Yeah. And <clears throat> because of the fact from the way from the way from the way that it's that it's being that's being described um it, within the within the when you ha you have the factions with the with um that with um cor with correlating body parts i'd like to, i'd like to go into that and just the vi just the vibe of those particular factions mm -hmm. um starting with the legs So, uh, Bonerland would be tied to the legs, uh, and Bonerland is very much inspired by mania and just drug culture in general. Mm -hmm. It's very much this constant overload of everything, basically. Uh, it's something you, you almost can't escape from. Like, it's the one happy part of the when, but it's almost too happy. Like, it's so happy that it becomes overwhelming and just not fun anymore. Uh, I suppose. I suppose in that regard, if I had to use an analog, I could probably bring up um, "We Happy Few," which was better in concept yeah. than it was in, in execution. "We Happy Few" would be a big inspiration as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I share the same feeling of it being not that great in execution. That had a lot of like uh, early game failures, basically. But the concept is really fun, and it's mm -hmm. been a big inspiration for this as well. Yeah. Um, what about the eyes? So the eyes will be tied to the bureau. Uh, the bureau is this massive, like bureaucratic organization that basically rules over the entirety of the event. Uh, it's very Kafkaesque in the sense that you basically just can't get anything from them. Uh, you need to sacrifice your entire life to to get some government funding or to to get a loan, basically. Mm -hmm. And they're really meant to be this overwhelming entity that keeps watching you from every corner, basically. When you mentioned when you mentioned bureau, the, f the first thing that came to mind is the la is the labyrinthine um, bureaucracy that's in stuff like Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a big inspiration as well. Control can be a big big part of that as well. Yeah, we we talked about control early on in the early on in the podcast, which I because at the at the time I was doing a comparative look between Sam Lake and David Cage. Spoiler, spoiler alert for that. Sam Lake ended up the be end up having the better output. <laughs> um, I ended up, I ended up spending about five minutes of that just ro just roasting Detroit become human because of how much of a misfire that was, <laughs> and and but um, I had said that while con while while control might not not bit not not might not be my particular bag, I still I still find it to be a far more honest. Game out, game out of remedy. Yeah, David Cage feels a bit. It, it beats you over the head with a metaphor, basically. That's also a thing that I kind of like that with, that we did with Lycoma is mm -hmm. you can basically run it in any kind of theming you want. Like you can go really grim, dark, and really heavy on the the more political angle, or you can go more for the meat angle and go for body horror, or you can go more funny, and just really lean into the craziness of it all. Uh, if someone asked me how I would pro how I would han how I would handle it as a GM, I'd probably say, um, "Think, think, t think. What if Terry Pratchett ro wrote a horror movie?" <laughs> I'd play that game. 
either, either Terry Terry Pratchett or or just what if you what if you asked um the asked Eric Idle and and the and just the whole Monty Python crew to make a um horror script with their particular brand of humor because <laughs> um whenever it comes to horror I've al- I've always leaned into one the fun the more funhouse style of horror that mm-hmm. you, that you would see at fairs and two um horror with a mixture of dar- of dark comedy um there's a th- there's a theater near my place that every that every Halloween plays through all three Evil Dead movies. <laughs> with a, with a little bit of intermission midway through because nobody's going to sit through three movies back to back even in a theater. <laughs> <laughs> but with the um with the hands would that mo- would that mostly be a lot of the a lot of the standard laborers. Yeah, that would mostly be inner city. Uh, technically, not really laborers. They're more the freeloaders, quote unquote. They're the people who refuse to sell their body to the state. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would be the ones who live in the slums, basically, uh, and they're constantly being raided by police. Their lives are basically the worst in the entire city. Mm-hmm. Oh, what about the masks? The mask would be Joytown. Uh, Joytown is kind of uh, uh, pairing together with Bonerland, which Bonerland is more focused on really heavy, ecstatic, manic part of drugs, and Joytown would be more focused on just calming everything down and just really submitting yourself to this kind of overwhelming, almost, yeah, almost like a religion type of organization. Mm -hmm. And the um, limbs... Uh, the limbs that would be the Black Lodge. Uh, the Black Lodge is basically our brown shirt, brown shirt faction. They're the fascists who kind of developed a dis- who basically developed a hatred for the freaks. They imagine that the freaks are the ones who destroyed the entire city, even though that's basically just propaganda from the bureau. Mm-hmm. And they would act as basically the main antagonist in the in the setting. Mm-hmm. And lastly, the torsos. Uh, the torsos, that would be the meatworks. And the meatworks, that's very much the central part of the setting. Uh, it's what makes what puts the meat in meat punk. Mm-hmm. It's this place where um, when you get arrested, your body basically just gets ground up into its core parts again. And those core parts then get used to help other laborers do their job better, basically. Mm-hmm. So, like, if, for example, you're a uh, a richer driver, uh, you would get extra legs to be able to run faster, stuff like that. Yeah. Now, going w- going with a going with a d6 pool based approach, is it a case where where it's sum a sum based or a success based um, type? Uh, we're mostly focusing on success based. Uh, you would get a six, one success at four or five, and two successes at six. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you would add those up, and then the amount of successes would need to surpass a designated amount beforehand, mm-hmm. and that would make you pass the best. Yeah. And is there any is there any sort of effect when it comes to when it comes to ones, or is that or is that just a not success? Uh, I think we do have an optional rule that a one cancels a failure and that that uh, crosses off success, uh, but that's an option. Mm-hmm. I, we I, we we played with that uh, at the beginning. Um, I think we landed on for the optional rule. Um, uh, if the the number of if that, that was it, if you have more one showing than successes, then it adds some kind of a narrative complication ah, to the situation. Yeah. So it's um. Kind of up to the GM. It normally won't apply like a numerical penalty, but it could in extreme circumstances. Mm-hmm. And some something. Uh, now, with with that in, with that in mind, when it comes to the when it comes to the body parts, the the six types: eyes, torsos, hands, arms, legs, and feels. Mm-hmm. 
even even if there's a wide variety of body parts with the individual types do they do they somewhat um lean into lean into a certain theme in terms of what they're going to be better at yeah so you would have the basic options that basically any hand could do that you could do with any hand cart or the same thing with limbs or legs um but there are also sort of teams around each deck like the uh hands for example are more themed around actively using um they're more themed around the setting of inner city but mm -hmm. Uh, and admittedly, with a, with a lot of them, I can I can kind of get the vibe of what of what they'd lean into. The only one that it that isn't that isn't covered up that isn't covered is feels. So, what exa what exactly would a feels body part entail? Yeah, uh, I think we updated that to the masks, uh, so that would be more just your face in general. Mm -hmm. So that would be stuff like. Um, it would mostly be focused on social interaction um, instead of physical, like, actions, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the masks uh, were originally called feels. Uh, I think that might just be a mistake on the Kickstarter page. Um, the feels just got renamed and adapted into a new card suit. It's an artifact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Upon character creation, is it a case where you would you would draw you would draw a card from each suit? Yeah. Uh, so the the core rule would be you get one card from each suit, mm -hmm. and that would compose of your entire body. Uh, there's also an optional rule that allows you to just draw six cards at random, so you would be able to have like six legs, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but that's an optional rule because of balance. That Some it... people might not find it. That easy to imagine a body with six legs. Um. Oh, well, if that if that's the case, then I'd, then I'd, I'd, pro I'd probably tell them, go go watch the fly a few t go watch the thing and the fly a few times. You'll figure yeah, it out. Yeah, Cronenberg is a big inspiration. So, yeah. Mm hmm. Oh. Uh, but in. <clears throat> And I, I I say I say theme because because it be it could be it could be very easy to have to have the body part effects be all over be all over the place and ha and having suits is 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 a way to control the control the chaos for lack of a better term. <laughs> but and I know I know that there's going to be a bunch of charts in the actual book in the actual book, but. Are we are we talking similar to to some of the random charts that that were seen in Mork Borg, or the or the upcoming um, obsolete shitty rules? Um, in what way exactly? Uh, in ter in terms of them in terms of them being used as story seats. Oh yeah, exactly. Um, the main the main focus of the charts and. The content of the book in general is very much story focused. We're not having that much of a heavy focus on mechanics. And if we do, they're more there to add to the story rather than be a secondary part of it. Mm -hmm. And all the charts and random tables are all meant actually add to the setting, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're very focused on like adding color and details. And uh, we've got a mission generator and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't know, I kind of want to get out in front of a counter-argument real quick that some people might level at us. Is um, I've been running the game uh, for the past couple weeks, and it's very rules light, but um, it's not what you would think of, I think, when you think of a, th a story game. like No, the, it's definitely the, not. The rule structure, like, it, it's a solid basis. It's a solid mechanical basis for running the game. And the game itself is very freeform in the interpretiveness, but it's not just totally freeform go nuts. There is a really solid structure undergirding the whole thing. Yeah, and I've, I will, I will admit, all critics have their whipping boys, and some story games are mine. Large, largely because there, there is a bit of, with story games that can they can easily fall into the trap of being a glorified mother. May I? Mm-hmm. Which, 
is cute is cute and all for for improv theater, but improv but nobody calls nobody goes to nobody watches whose line is it anyway and think that it's an actual game. Yeah, we we do have a strong focus on it actually being like fun, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, one one thing I saw in the in the example of the bo- of the booklet was the um quote unquote stat block for the shadow informant. Mm-hmm. The so when it comes when it comes to NPCs and enc- encounters and the like, um, how how do you tr- how how would how would one track their their condition and ju- and just the um ways to, the ways to overcome to actually actually succeed in roles against them um with npcs that it would be a uh, roll against mechanic so you would have um the npc would roll a set amount of dice and you would need to roll more successes than them mm. in order to pass um and we have like three groupings of npcs we have basically the the chumps who are just the 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 undercity we're just the they live in the slums basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have the cocks, who are the most or the biggest workers in the city. And you would find the most of them. Uh, and we also have the cunts, who are basically the big leaders of the city, and those would serve as the main antagonists. Mm-hmm. And that's also the ones who are in that booklet. Yeah. Now with within that within that, and I, I ended up asking this of the Mork Borg crew as as well, and if I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this. Um during testing of Lycoma, have have you guys ever done have you guys ever done a more hex crawl like approach? We have not, but it would actually be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see a reason it wouldn't work if you wanted to do something like that. Yeah. I'm not saying full. I'm not saying full on hex crawl map of the, of the city because that would because that would be a bit redundant. But in terms of move moving from moving from moving from a um, mind map st- mind map style setup of areas and with different events, mm-hmm. uh, that's something I could see happening with this game because I've seen I've seen it happen with with plenty of with plenty of similar affairs. It could work for sure, yeah. Oh, and I'd also I'd also seen that uh, in that in that NPC example that it drop it drops two cards. I'm guess and I'm guessing that even even with the even with the um, initial card setup, unless you're using that optional rule, you can't you can't one you can't have more than six, and two you can't have more than one of one type. Yeah, so the cards you would get would be added to your faction deck, basically. Mm-hmm. And your faction deck is what you can swap out cards from at any point, basically. Um, if both your faction deck and your personal card deck run out, then you're out of the game, basically. You can mm-hmm. choose a new faction, a new character, and if all of the cards run out at some point, then the entire win is dead, basically. Yeah, and I I can I can certainly get that. Now with the, with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as the um page count for the bo- for the book itself? Um it's a bit hard to determine page count since we're working with a box set instead of a full book. Mm-hmm. Um but we currently have I think over 90 art pieces. Mm-hmm. We're looking at about guessing Couple of eighty spreads or something. I I can I can certainly get that. Um, and I know I know you guys are shoot are shooting for physical, but have you guys give have you guys um debated internally about how about how one might go about playing Lycoma in a virtual tabletop sense? Because with the card thing, I could I could see it be I could see it potentially being tricky, but still somewhat doable. We've tried it before just through Discord, basically just setting up a personal channel, sending the cards in there as physical images, and then using that as reference. Uh, we are looking into actually setting up a virtual tabletop, but that's still something that, that's on the horizon, basically. 
yeah, having been on the player side and the GM side virtually, um, it's actually pretty smooth. It um, It's not as convenient as having the physical cards on the table in front of you, but uh, there isn't any real obstruction or difficulty that I've run into any time. Mm -hmm. I, I can certainly see that. And what would you guys be shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, the PDS, um, I'm guessing, would drop in, don't know what beta this, but March-ish. I'm guessing there would be done around then. And for the uh, physical release, I think we're aiming for August. Mm -hmm. So, right. That'll be, which, that'll be... I, I can I can certainly see, I can certainly see that particular gap, especially with the um, hell that it that is get that is getting stuff printed. Yes. Yeah, and we also rather overestimate than underestimate the amount of time it takes. The whole the whole under promise over deliver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I can certainly see that. Well, with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you guys for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the and um, brave the hell that is time zones to me to come here yeah thank you for having us yeah thank you very much we appreciate it mm -hmm. and anytime you see fit to return whether it's for more of lycoma or for whatever else you get you guys happen to make uh my door my door is always open as thank i often you. say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> i'll bring beer next time um, just don't, just don't bring Bud Light or something like that. I, <laughs> uh, and of course, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>